New Jersey schools are collectively among the best in the country, but they are also among the most segregated. A coalition of groups and students have formed to challenge that status in court. Hi, everybody. This is Reporters Roundtable. I'm David Cruz. As we look at this case and the rest of the week's news, we'll hear from a talented group of reporters from around the state, including Stacey Sherman. She is the deputy managing editor for U.S. bureaus at Bloomberg. Sophie Nieto Munoz is a reporter for New Jersey Monitor. And Dustin Rassiopi is the State House reporter for The Record, USA Today Network. We'll hear from that panel in a few moments, but we start today with one of the attorneys who built this case. She is the director and founder of the Inclusion Project at Rutgers University and a professor at Rutgers Law School. Good to see you again, Elise Body. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. So uh, there was a court hearing this week after a long delay. Uh, what was this hearing or was that the whole case? Well, the, the purpose of the hearing um, was for the judge to uh, hear from both plaintiffs and the defendants, the people who brought the case and, and the state, um, about whether, uh, about how the case should be resolved. The state is saying that the case should be dismissed. The plaintiffs, of course, are saying that the case could, should continue. Um, uh, plaintiffs are also arguing that uh, the, the facts are very clear, the law is very clear, uh, the court should find that the state is responsible for fixing this problem, um, and then we can move on to the remedy stage. Uh, and the, the state is either looking to dismiss it, or it's making this uh, argument that to me seems untenable, which is that first, uh, the plaintiff should have to show that the harm can be repaired before the court can find that uh, the state is responsible for fixing it. There were a lot of odd arguments made, um, but is what happened this week the total sum of the case? Does it now go to a, a judge for a, a ruling and then yeah, so the, um, so, the, so the judge heard argument in the case, and uh, now the judge has to decide how he's going to rule. Um, he has said that his, his opinion will issue in due course. Uh, not really clear what that means as a practical matter, um, but I assume that he will write a very uh, careful and, and reasoned opinion. It may take some time, uh, but uh, so, so we... we uh, don't know where we'll fall on the calendar, um, but uh, I guess you know we could say maybe one month or so. If I had to, if I if I had to guess, I would say it was probably one month, maybe two months. Um, yeah. But yeah. So as for what happened, the state the state said the plaintiffs failed to define segregation, let alone prove it. The 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 state's arguments. Um, I, it's it's really it, how to say this. It's hard even to understand uh, yeah. what what the state is saying. The facts are so clear; they are damningly clear. We have several hundred thousand um, Black and Latino students, as well as white students, by the way, uh, who are in intensely segregated schools. Uh, we're relying on the state's own data. This is not data that came from the plaintiffs. I should say I'm not on the on the legal team. So when I say right. we, I'm just really referring to the legal team. But um, you know, the 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 facts are very straightforward and very clear. What this data said is, well, when they interviewed the individual uh, plaintiffs who who brought the case, these are you know, these are uh, social justice leaders and parents. And, and they said, well, they didn't have a clear definition of segregation. Well, you know, that's, that's just nonsense. And it's intended to be as distraction. Um, it's very, it's, it's quite apparent uh, that our children are very isolated um, from each other across the state. And you, you alluded to this a little bit, but it's, I think, worth repeating that this is not about uh, exclusively black and brown kids and their segregated schools. It's about white kids and their segregated schools as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, traditionally, uh, the law has been focused on uh, Black and Latino children. Uh, but when you look at the data, uh, white students are also segregated. And we have to be very clear that segregation harms anyone. This is not just a black and brown problem. Um, when you divide uh, people and, and put them in, in different schools, they lose the opportunity to, to learn uh, from one another, to learn alongside one another. The research shows that this has uh, a lasting impact um, because that's, you know, when you, um, uh, when you don't learn with or have a chance to get to know people who are different, um, you, you know, you come to fear difference. And we've seen that time and time again. And the research has been very clear on this point. It also helps kids to learn about one another as well. You know, I, I think maybe this doesn't need saying, but I'll say it anyway. White kids benefit from being around black and brown kids, too. And I don't think that that part of that argument gets stated enough when people talk about desegregating schools. Yeah, absolutely. And and we've seen, um, again, from places where this has been done, there are examples of this all, you know, different parts of the country, um, you know, and, and um, white students, you know, value the opportunity to learn alongside uh, black and brown children, um, for sure. I've, I've heard that from white students who have been in integrated environments. And they think it's weird, actually, when uh, they go to college and then they and they you know they learn from other uh, fellow students who have attended isolated schools as well. Um, they just don't understand you know how that can possibly happen. People, when you get into an integrated environment that is you know equitable and fair, um, you know students students thrive and all students thrive, and it's really important to understand that. I want to get you on the record on this again. I know that we have talked about um, your feelings for how the governor has uh, participated uh, in this situation. Uh, some of the arguments that you heard, do you ever wonder if they, if those weird arguments like s almost an endorsement of separate, separate but equal uh, that I heard there, uh, do you think that if, if the governor heard that, that he would feel that that represents his point of view? Well, you know, I it's it's really hard for me to um, understand what the what the governor is doing here, what his administration is doing. The seg the governor has acknowledged that segregation exists. Uh, if you read the state's brief uh, in response to uh, the plaintiff's arguments, they're essentially saying. Uh, they're essentially making the argument that, well, the, the schools are separate, but they're equal. Well, first of all, they're not equal. Uh, we know uh, that there are that there continue to be funding issues um, uh, with the way that the the, the state um, funds the public schools and funds black and brown schools in particular. Um, but also, we know that um, you know separate but equal is uh, is inherently unequal. And it just, it doesn't work. And the state has tolerated this problem for generations. The state has known about this and it's refused to do anything about it. And, you know, as I, as I said in the opening, the state is making this, you know, crazy argument that the, the court shouldn't find that we're responsible for fixing the problem until the plaintiffs show that it can be fixed. And that just can't be the way that the law works. Name the the most easily attainable remedy that could come out of this. Really, I have twenty seconds. Literally, there are uh, interdistrict uh, choice programs. There are uh, magnet programs that could be that could be developed on a regional scale, where students from all over the region would be allowed to attend. Um, you can redraw district lines. There are lots of different ways to do this. And by the way, there are experts in the country who know how to do this and who are who stand ready to help. All right, Elise Body, always a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk again. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. All right, let's turn to our panel now. Stacy, Sophie, Dust, Dustin, uh, good to see you all. Stacy, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Sophie, that's a big case that has flown under the radar because it's dragged on uh, for so long, but it could result in a historic restructuring of the state's public schools, no? Yeah, um, I mean, like she said, it could be a matter of weeks or months uh, before a decision is made, but it's going to fundamentally change the way that New Jersey students go to school and where they can go to school. And we're going to see the funding structure change. 
Uh, we don't know what the remedy is going to be. She, um, Elise had just brought up magnet schools as a good idea. Um, the lawsuit cites that as an example of what was done in Hartford, Connecticut, with a similar lawsuit in the 90s. Um, so it's dragged on for a really long time. It's going to drag on a little more. And the remedies, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, it's definitely going to change the way that every student in New Jersey um, attend school basically. Yeah. And that's going to be something that at least, uh, the, the Murphy administration is going to have to at least begin to implement if there are any remedies called for Stacy, could you see some suburban districts saying, I'm not sending my kids to X, Y, Z, big city school. I pay my taxes here in ABC suburb changes that, that would have to be implemented would trigger some serious reactions and, and pushback, would you think? Um, I definitely think so. This is not something that can be fixed easily, and you're going to get a lot of pushback from um, suburban districts that like their schools the way they are. So um, it should be interesting, and it's going to take a while. Let's turn now to what, for the first time in years, is not the top story of every newscast, COVID. The endemic is near, say most experts. Phil Murphy, following the data always, determined that this Friday was the best Friday for his final COVID briefings. Dustin, you've had the great fortune to sit in on a lot of those. You going to miss it? <laughs> I'm sure at some point I'll, I'll miss um, having that access. But um, it has been two years of, you know, sometimes three days a week, sometimes two. Lately, it's been one day a week. Uh, two years of listening to the same same sort of rundown, the governor saying the woman who needs no introduction. Uh, it, so it's been um, it's been uh, it's been a long two years in so many ways. But as far as those those press press briefings go, I think um, I speak for many reporters when when I say that we're happy to move on to maybe a different um, type of accessibility to the governor. Right, maybe just a weekly press conference. Uh, did you go to all of these or just most? Uh, I wasn't keeping track, but I've been to, I'd say most of them. And, um, you know, I, re I recall vividly the first ones uh, around this time two years ago when we all crammed into the state police um, operations center in, in West Trenton and uh, they were announcing, oh, we have one case, we have two cases, four cases, and we're all just sitting in there huddled up next to each other, no masks. And the message right. back then was, be sure to wash your hands and cover your mouth. Uh, it, it's it's kind of crazy to think back how naive we all were, we being people like me, um, mm -hmm and, and uh, how far we've come since then and what we've learned. Stacy, the governor's briefings were some of our most watched live streams for NJPBS. I remember he used to have on special guests, almost like a talk show. Uh, he was uh, able to take advantage of the attention, no, Stacy? I think in, in many ways he was. He became a, a national figure because of these um, press briefings. New York and New Jersey were the, the earliest and hardest hit. And so um, Governor Murphy and New York Governor Ben Cuomo really used it to their advantage. Not They just used the opportunity of appearing on, on national TV and being the voice of reason and leadership um, that people were seeking. So yeah, I think it, I think it did help them in that way. Sophie, you lost the coin toss that we conducted before the show without your knowledge. So you get the Murphy for president question. Can Murphy parlay his perceived success of handling the COVID crisis into national recognition and perhaps a White House run? I mean, it wouldn't be the first time we see a New Jersey politician make a run for the White House. Um, so I think that, you know, there is definitely potential that these viral moments that have picked up and this national stage that Murphy has gone to be on, um, he could use to his advantage. But like I said, we've seen, you know, Cory Booker run, we've seen Chris Christie run. Um, do we want to see another New Jersey politician run? 
I don't know if that's uh, what New Jerseyans want. And I think we've seen that in the past. All right, let's see how the guy handles the next two years anyway. Um, starting with this budget, which uh, he presents uh, next Tuesday. Why, yes, we will have live coverage. Thanks for asking. More on that later. But uh, budget season, like spring, is about to break out. Dustin, what's going to be the headline coming out of the governor's budget speech next week? Um, taking a, a guess based off of the recent announcement um, that he's rolling out this property tax relief program, uh, I, I, I'm guessing that it's going to be something along the lines of, wow, we have a lot of money. What are we going to do with it? Um, which traditionally hasn't been the case. Um, coupled with that, I'm sure Murphy's going to take uh, somewhat of a victory lap and and say that his policies uh, are really working. He gave a little bit of, of a preview of that this week when he unveiled that property tax program. So I, I expect it to, uh, to hear that things are in really good shape and uh, I'm doing a really good job. <laughs> Um, Stacy, flush with cash, the state is, says everybody. Uh, what should that mean? Everybody's going to get their groups and causes funded and the business community is going to get all kind of tax breaks? I uh, don't know about that. I know we, we have money be for two main reasons. Uh, one is because of the recovery. I mean, we were, the re people are were home and they were eager to get out and spend money and so our revenue is more than expected and then we have federal stimulus that is not going to be here forever um, but um, people should expect that the the governor is going to um, spend money he's going to respond to the election results which um, in November were a bit closer than he would have liked to see and he said that he got a message from that 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 people really need uh, tax relief. And so I think he's start, just starting already um, responding to that by, by handing out um, tax rebates. I want to circle back to COVID uh, for a couple of minutes and maybe get each of you to reflect um, on how it started and how it's going in dealing with COVID in any aspect of your life, professional uh, or otherwise. Sophie, let's start with you. The last two years. Um, the last two years have been definitely interesting. I mean, I started in the state house in November of 2019. So I was, you know, only got like a good six months before I was sent to my apartment in Jersey city for two years, basically. Right. So it's been really interesting. I've been through like four budgets, it feels like. So, uh, I don't know. It's just been a whirlwind of two years, but the, when I reflect back on it, I think the biggest story has really been unemployment and seeing how many people have suffered and continue to suffer. I think that's just a continuing theme of the pandemic. And, you know, even two years down now, this is an endemic. We're still seeing how people are hurting and really what the recovery is going to look like. And also to how the systems, the, the safety net, as it were, uh, was shredded, particularly, you know, Department of Labor, uh, motor vehicles, all of those. Uh, I mean, it, it exposed fissures in all of those areas, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I remember maybe April 2020, Governor Murphy was asking for people who knew COBOL, which is a language from the 60s, uh, to help right. fix the unemployment system. And I mean, when you think back to that, it's just crazy that that even that we even needed help with that, that that wasn't dealt with, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, but then again, even yesterday, uh, there's still all these problems because yesterday's uh, hearing on the segregated schools was marred by technical difficulties for like an hour. So, I mean, I don't know how much uh, has been learned from in that sense. Dustin, um, you went to a lot, a lot of these briefings, but you were also covering, um, you know, how people were, were treated by the Department of Labor, uh, motor vehicles. This was a, a, a also an exposure of how the systems fail the people most in need. No, Dustin? That's, that's primarily the takeaway for me in this last two years. It makes you think about 
what the role of government is and what its capabilities are and what really gets ignored over, over time by various administrations because it's not really sexy to go campaigning on, on creating Department of Labor a computer systems for a major uh, you know, catastrophe. So all these different systems get overlooked for, for such a long period of time. And um, on the other hand, you also see how quickly government can respond in ways that it can, you know, by basically printing more money and, and giving everybody checks to, so they can survive. But that's yeah. clearly not enough. And um, I think just making government work on a broad level and to be prepared for a catastrophe um, is really so important. And, and this pandemic has, has been clarifying on that. Stacy, reflecting over the last two years in the house, out in work, and when your house became your work. Yes, you, you'll you'll see. I'm I'm in my office. I'm the one of the only ones in my office, and I'm really happy to be back here. Um, this has been a, a challenging two years. I mean, for for working moms like me, I was home with my um, you know my my two special needs kids, um, trying to do remote schooling and edit stories at the same time. It was really tough. I think I learned and everyone learned the importance of kids being in school, not only for the moms and the dads, but for the kids as well. So I think a lot um, hopefully will change. And I think um, we're really gonna need to address these issues, so learning loss for kids, and then what to do in, because there will be another crisis like this down the line. And how, how do you deal with that? Um, how do you deal with childcare and schools and, and still have women working? Let me get to some other news while I can. We've got just a couple of minutes left. Uh, Steve Sweeney launches a think tank at Rowan. Dustin, who will be better served, the public or Steve Sweeney's state profile? Short answer. <laughs> Steve Sweeney, no doubt. I'll make no doubt about it, although I'm sure he'll put out some white papers that people may find beneficial. This talk of uh, Josh Gottheimer for Governor Sophie uh, do you think he has a shot? We will chip in for a venti latte. If you answer, who is Josh Gottheimer? Um, I have really lost all the coin flips today, haven't I? Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't think enough people know who he is, but I mean, he could take a stab at it. Um, I, I'm not sure <laughs> what, what people know about him, if I'm being frank. Uh, a bill set to, um, a bill set to uh, die in the state legislature would allow for you to pump your own gas. Would you ever? I'm really embarrassed to admit this and I'm blushing, but I am not a, I do not know how. I am a, a Jersey girl and I, I don't, I mean, I guess I could figure it out, but I've never really had to. Um, I would, I, I think if, if there's any time for it to happen with what's going on with Ukraine, um, and what's going on with the labor shortage, now is the time, but I don't know if New Jersey is just stubborn. We're the only ones where you can pump your own gas and I don't know if it's ever gonna happen. All right, Stacy's a big no on that one. All right, Stacy, Sophie, Dustin, good to see you all. Thanks for coming on with us and for being good sports today. That's Roundtable for this week. Thanks also to Elise Body. A program note, we'll have live coverage of the governor's budget address Tuesday, live at 2 p.m. on NJPBS and on all of our streaming platforms. Join me along with the duo of Rhonda Schaffler and John Reitmeyer, plus other special guests as we break down the budget and tell you what it all means to you. That's Tuesday at 2 on NJPBS. You can follow me on Twitter at David Cruz NJ and be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel for more Chatbox, Business Beat, and NJ Spotlight news. Thanks for watching, everybody. For all the crew over here, I'm David Cruz. We'll see you next week. Major funding for Reporters Roundtable with David Cruz is provided by New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, 
serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. Rowan University, educating New Jersey leaders, partnering with New Jersey businesses, transforming New Jersey's future. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Business Magazine, the magazine of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, reporting to executive and legislative leaders in all 21 counties of the Garden State since 1954, and by Politico's New Jersey Playbook, a topical newsletter on Garden State politics, online at politico.com. We'll be right